Oh, first giving praises to God, to Bishop Snorton, to the leadership, organizers, and sponsors of the 2015 Phenomenal Woman Summit, and to each and every beautiful sister, not sister, but sister, and my esteemed brothers here with us, I would just like to say good morning. I am truly honored and humbled to have this opportunity. I don't take this invitation lightly at all. I really don't. Because anytime I have an opportunity to encourage someone or at least open someone's eyes to new possibilities or introduce them to my father, I'm thankful because I'm living out my purpose and I'm living out my dream. And I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you, thank you, thank you, Bishop, for remembering me and extending this invitation to me this morning. God willing, and with your prayers, I would like to contribute to this weekend's conversations um, by talking a little bit more about how do we live fully in the midst of life challenges. I have a little experience with living fully in the midst of life challenges. May we pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity to share a word that comes from you. Lord, I ask that you let me be your temple, your vessel, in order to say that which needs to be heard this morning by those who are here under the sound of my voice. Father, I ask a special blessing upon the bishop, upon the organization, upon every person and their family that's represented here this morning. Father, I thank you in advance for what you will do in the few moments we will have together. Father, I thank you. I just want to praise you and honor you because we know your grace is sufficient. These and other blessings I ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, I know I had the opportunity to say a prayer, but I got to tell you about my daddy, okay? Just for a moment. I'll, I'll never miss the opportunity to talk about my father. I must recognize the one who continuously assures me my worth and my value who has delivered me from my own wrongdoings. You know. The one who has enabled me to have victory in the midst of things that sometimes we cause ourselves and sometimes some other folks has caused it for us. Um, the beauty of the one that I speak of loves me unconditionally. He forgives me over and over and over again. He'll probably forgive me for this conference over with, okay? Okay? My father, the one that I speak of, does not give me a spirit of fear. The one that I speak of created me in his image. He is the author and the finisher of my faith and gives me a peace in knowing that with him, Nothing, nothing shall be impossible. I must give honor, praise, and thanks to our Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. But so can you. I know I'm in the right place, right? Okay. Because just like he did it for me, he'll do it for you. Amen? The words endureth forever tells us his mercy has no end. There are no time limits. It will not expire nor run out. I cannot think of anything that goes on forever but the love of our Lord and Savior. Secondly, when we look at the passage of Scripture, Luke 1 and 37, we are told nothing shall be impossible. But let us know it also says with God, not with Mama, my dear, Mama and them, Daddy, your husband, your ex, your education, your relationships, your bank account, your job titles, I can go on and on, but none of those things can enable you to do anything. You got to have God. The words, nothing shall be impossible, gives assurance that no matter what the odds, opposition, obstacles, or challenges we face, we can have the victory and we can live fully. When you look around at all the unfortunate circumstances our country is experiencing right now, 
Some would have you to believe there is no way we can have the victory. I mean, think about it. Unarmed individuals being killed by those who we trust to protect and serve us, but also those who we trust to protect and serve are being killed for senseless reasons. We live in a time where there's so much domestic violence, there's human trafficking, there are children whose innocence is being stolen, there's rampant hopelessness, a decline in graduation rates, no accountability, and economic, racial, social, and political crisis at every turn. With all that said, that sounds kind of depressing, doesn't it? But it don't have to be when you know who's on the throne. But see, that's what Satan will have you to believe. Satan works full time on his job. We work with some folks who come to work, but you know what they're doing. Okay, they're just sitting in that cubicle looking at the clock. But when Satan clock in, he has never clocked out. That boy works 24, 7, 7 days, 365. And, but I must note, though, he can't do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. So his assignment, he carries out every moment of the day. He tries to condemn us, make us feel hopeless, send enemies our way, create drama in our houses, make our children act crazy. Anything that he can do to give, make us raise doubt and believe that it's over, but it's not. My mission today is to present evidence that you can live fully in the midst of life challenges and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that we serve a God that assures us that it ain't over. If you will, I will ask that you help me this morning by serving as the jury for me today. So please listen to the evidence closely. With respect for time, I ask your permission to present my case in a modified, condensed version, somewhat similar to like breaking news. You know when they do breaking news, they just give you the highlights and then they say we'll have the full story at five o'clock. Okay, if, may I have your permission to give you that version because I could go on all day because I love to talk. Okay, do I have your permission? Okay, do I have a motion? So moved, do we have a second? Okay, it's been moved and properly second that I can give you the condensed version of my case. Thank you, thank you. Um, helping me to prove this case, I'm going to call up a few of my biblical phenomenal sisters, okay? Um, boy, these sisters living in the midst of life challenges is nothing new. They had some challenges. Like us, the phenomenal biblical sisters of the past found themselves in the same situations we find ourselves in today. Now, I know none of you all probably watch regular TV or cable, but uh, there's some shows right now called um, Empire. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Y'all know nothing about that. Uh, Scandal, The Have and The Have Nots. Okay, uh, and let us not forget, um, HBO came up with power. It's amazing all these shows that, you know, try to show you the challenges people have. But it's not new. Back in biblical times, there was some drama. Um, let me call my first sister, and you know who I'm talking about. Um, I need to give you the... Um, condensed version of Sister Sarah's deposition. Now, you all know Sarah, right? Sarah was married to Abraham. And Abraham was the one that God said, you will be the father of many nations. Well, Sarah was kind of up in age. She was past that menopausal sign. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So to imagine having a child at her age 
and it just didn't make any sense. She just couldn't see it happening. But just like some of these shows we don't watch, they had some drama. And you know how we are when we're impatient. We stir some stuff up. Sarah decided to help the Lord out with his promise to her husband and gave Abraham permission to be close to her maidservant. We're going to keep this clean. We're going to keep this clean. But you know, Abraham didn't say no. Okay. Okay. All right. But that's a whole nother speech, okay? That's a whole nother speech right there, okay? Abraham ended up having some, if I may, baby mama drama. Okay. So that's nothing new. So it's nothing new. So Sarah finds herself in the midst of life challenges, even though she helped create some of those challenges. Same thing that we do. But it's okay because you all know how her story ends. Did she not bring forth that son that God had promised? You know why she was able to do that? Because it ain't over. Okay? May I call one of my, my other sister around the corner? Esther. You all know Esther. She was living up in the palace with her king, enjoying everything. But, you know, just like now, we have haters. That caused some challenges as well. So in this case, Haman decided that he was going to hate on the Jews. And so, and you know, Mordecai, I love him. I could just see when Haman coming by on his horse just riding. Mordecai went, whatever. And, and he got hot. You know how that go. You know how that go. So um, Haman did his little plotting, like some folks do right now, nothing's changed, and decided that um, he came up with this plan to get rid of the Jews. So Mordecai's cousin, Esther, was up in the palace. He sent word to her and said, look, you need to go talk to your husband and let him know what's going on so that we can make sure this doesn't happen. But just, Esther, just like many of us, we don't only get scared. What do we do? We get scared. She was scared. She was like, uh-uh, I can't go and talk to my husband if he don't send for me. People have lost their lives standing up to my husband. It's nothing new. But, you know, Mordecai reminded her that maybe you're in the palace right now for such a time as this. Well, you all know how the story go. You know, she went ahead and stepped up to the plate. Isn't that what phenomenal women do? She stepped up to the plate, she came up with the plan, and she made sure that the Jews were okay. But what I find most interesting about that story is the one that was hating in the first place ended up, he up out of here. You know why? Because he found out we serve a it ain't over God, okay? Don't mess with his children, okay? Now, I love this girl right here. I'm about to give her brief deposition for you. It's Ruth. Ruth. You know, Ruth was happily married. And you know, I'm giving you the breaking news version. So my Bible scholars, if by some chance you want to read the full testimony, um, I recommend this book right here. Okay? All right? Okay? Because I want to respect our time. But Ruth, husband and um, father-in-law and her brother-in-law, they went off to war. They didn't come back. And uh, she was a widow. And Naomi, being a mother-in-law, was so sweet, so kind. She basically told her in laws y'all going on way back to your people. But not Ruth. Ruth was faith. So, you know what's really cool? Sarah, I mean, um, Ruth just working in the fields. And Boaz came by. He saw her. And I love a man who look out for his woman. What did he tell his servants? Y'all leave a little extra behind so she don't have to work as hard. I love it. I love it. So you all know how the story ended, okay? She ended up marrying Boaz. 
okay? Once again, you would have thought because her husband didn't come back and she decided they was just going to be me and my mother-in-law, God said, it ain't over. So now she got married again. Now, y'all forgive me on this one because I'm, I'm, you know, you all see how I use the Bible. I have to kind of, you know, you know how they say the message Bible. I kind of mess it up a little bit, you know, God forgive me. But, uh, okay, I'm going to try to say this, this sister's name. Y'all help me. Jochebed, Moses' mama. How you say her name? Jochebed. Okay, we're going to say Moses' mama. <laughs> Okay, Moses' mother loved her baby. She loved her baby. And unfortunately, once again, she lived in a time where people just mess with you just to be messing with you. This decree come down that you're going to kill the firstborn boy and everybody's family. But she's just like any good phenomenal woman. She said, not my child. Not my child. You won't get him. So what I love about Moses' mama <laughs> is she stepped out on faith. That's what phenomenal women do in the midst of life challenges. You don't go get on the phone or the internet or WebND and all that kind of stuff and be trying to call, what's his name, Shannara and all them to try to figure out what to do. She called on the Lord. She stepped out on faith. She put her baby in that basket and she let him go on down that river. Now, you know, come on now, you know she was probably scared to death. There were gators in that water. She didn't know what was going to happen, but she was a phenomenal woman who knew that it ain't over. So she trusted her daddy. But isn't it just amazing what he does? Not only was her baby safe, Moses said, he ended up living in the house with the one who was trying to get rid of him in the first place. And, and, and then what even makes it more beautiful is that who got the opportunity to care for her own baby? His mom. You know why he was, she was able to do that? Because she served a it ain't over God. So I think, amen. So I, I think you would agree that all these women found themselves in the midst of life challenges. We all do. But by the grace of God, they also found out it ain't over. But I know we got to fast forward a little bit. Those are sisters way back in the time. And, I, and I, could, I could name sisters throughout history. I could stop by the civil rights and no, no, I can go back before then. I can go get Harriet Tubman or, you know, or, or I can go get Rosa. I mean, I could go get Rosa Parks, any of them. But I want to fast forward a little bit and talk about one of my, my dear sisters who's a phenomenal woman named Michelle. You know, now think about it now. Michelle was married. Her husband was named Barack. Okay? And they lived in Chicago. And I could just imagine how that conversation went that night at the kitchen table when Barack said, you know, I think I could be the president. She said, yeah, I think you can too. And he said, but you know, what's the probability of a black man being able to live in the White House. I mean, logically, you would think it's over before he ever started. But he had a good wife, a phenomenal woman. I just can imagine as she put the dishes up, she turned around and said, yes, we can. <laughs> Because it ain't over. So you all know how that story ends. Not only did Mr. Um, Barack Obama become president one time, got it two times. That's what you call servant, a it ain't over guy. Okay? And but this knowing that, you know, everybody have challenges, we can't live, leave out our little people. You all remember Gabby Douglas, okay? Okay, Gabby wanted to be a gymnast. Her mom didn't have the type of funds and resources to have a trainer and everything, but you all know the story. You know, her mom stepped out on faith, and God made a way out of no way, and she ended up moving, living with the trainer. But, you know, it's amazing that when you think you're on your way to be delivered, 
Satan who hadn't clocked out yet, okay, he jumps back in the game and she gets injured before the Olympics. And you know, at that point, she was already considered a long shot anyway. Where did this little chocolate child come from? You know? But what ended up happening, not only did she recover from that injury just in time for the Olympus, she brought home the gold. Why was she able to do that? She serves the It Ain't Over God. And, that, and, and may I pause and do a commercial, because I got two little Barack Obamas at my house, okay? And they better be at school right now, okay? But I teach my children, we need to teach our children in these times that are, seem uncertain, they don't have to yield or succumb to any of these dramas when they know who they belong to. We need to make sure our little people know it ain't over and that they have someone they can depend upon no matter what's happening. Because Satan got some folks out here messing with them. Got them thinking they want to be transgender. No disrespect. But when I read the Bible, I read about Adam and Eve. Okay, I don't leave that alone. That's another speech. That's another speech. I don't leave that alone. But I had to pause and raise awareness of that because if you're waiting on somebody else to make sure your child okay, okay, you better not do that. I treat my children like SpongeBob. When they get home from school, I wring out all that stuff they done picked up. Okay, don't bring that up in here. Okay? All right, I'm sorry, I digress. That's a whole nother speech, whole nother speech, I'm sorry. But um, as I continue to prove this case, I gotta bring forth my personal testimony. Because I know what it is to live in the midst of life challenges, okay? Um, and we all have it, but it's interesting to me, let's just go, I'll just pick one, because I got quite a few of them. But I can tell you how this story ends before I tell you the beginning. I'm living fully, okay? I live fully. It's a choice, and you can make that choice when you know who you belong to. Okay. Well, when Matthew was born, I thought I had a perfect pregnancy back in 2004. I mean, I worked on Friday and Matthew was born on Monday. That's just how good the pregnancy was. I didn't have any issues. Matthew's pregnancy with him was so good that the nurse said, if the doctor don't get here soon, I'm going to deliver this baby. Because he, he was ready. I mean, he had, it was, when I say a perfect pregnancy, it was perfect, perfect delivery. Then the doctor comes in and tells me he has a severe case of jaundice. Okay, well, that wasn't anything new. When Jay was born, he had jaundice. We went home and they put him in that little tanning booth for a few days and he was okay. But this doctor tells me that um, his case is severe. We need to put him in neonative intensive care. Now, mind you, he was born on December 20th. This is my Christmas present. We supposed to be at the house on December 25th with this baby. Well, we didn't end up coming home till New Year's Eve. So I was truly in the midst of life challenges over there at St. Vincent's. I didn't know I could cry so hard. I was doing all kinds of negotiation because this doctor that came in here talking about, well, he could possibly have spina bifida. I'm like, how do you spell spina bifida? <laughs> You know, um, he could possibly have um, cerebral palsy. Statistics show children that are born with these levels could have all these disabilities and everything. But I'm, I'm glad I uh, found out I serve that it ain't over God. Because if I could call Matthew in here right now to testify, he'll be here about two seconds because he's running. Okay? He's running. Okay? So. That's just one of the many examples that I found out. Why am I worried and stressed when I know God? Didn't I say earlier, all things are possible with God? Not with St. Vincent, with God, okay? Well, then in 2008, I go get my little regular checkup, my annual checkup, which, let me do my commercial, get your checkups, okay? Um, I went in thinking everything was normal, ended up coming out being diagnosed with stage one breast cancer. 
And I was in a state of shock because I had no symptoms. I got two small children. My career is on a fast track. I'm semi-happily married. And I'm like, I got breast cancer? like any good Christian with this diagnosis, I ran to my daddy and I started negotiating. Lord, if you deliver me from this, I'm going to become a better person. I'm going to go back to Bible study and actually stay in there and not sit in the back of the church and talk. I mean, I, I said I'm going to start cooking because at this time in my life, you know, I had my cell phone. I had old Charlie's, I had Chili's, the Chinese place on the east side off of Port of Madrid, Cracker Barrel at the Colonnade. I just had everything. I wasn't trying to cook for nobody, okay? But um, I, I was declared cancer free in February 2009. Yeah. And I found out, you know, that it ain't over, but you know how you find yourself in the, remember I said we do things to ourselves? I, um, it wasn't long after I was declared cancer free, I started backsliding again. Um, but he forgave me. And uh, I go back to the doctor like three months later with some new, with some complaints, and she tell me I got shingles. And I'm like, hold up, wait a minute, okay. What are you trying to tell me, you know, Lord, okay? She said I was experiencing stress. And that's, that just opened up a whole nother world. But I got over that too. Why? Because I serve a it ain't over God. Because he will heal you, okay? But, you know, I still, I found out during that 2008, 2009 period what it took to truly be able to live fully in the midst of life challenges. You got to have some peace. So that was my new prayer. I said, Lord, if you just let me have some peace, everything else will work itself out. And in the process of gaining peace, he literally, and that's what I ended up writing the book about, you know, self-inflicted overload. I was doing it to myself, trying to be superwoman without superpowers, trying to act like I was perfect when there's only one that is perfect, okay? Um, and he gave me that peace. The letters, the word, P-E-A-C-E. -E. The P, I had to start praying for real, okay? I had to put some things on the altar. I had to surrender and die to myself so that I could live in him. So that was the P to lead to having peace. Next, the E, I had to have some energy because Satan's still working 24-7. And you need to have your strength when he brings something at you. You need to be in your best physical mental and spiritual state when it come at you because you're going to have to deal with it, okay? He didn't say you weren't going to have to deal with anything. So with having energy, you had, I had to start focusing on taking care of me physically, okay? And I encourage you to do that. I'm not going to tell you do Weight Watchers. I'm not going to tell you that Jenny Craig, but I will say this. Stop driving around Walmart parking lot trying to get a space at the front. Okay? Just go ahead and park in the back or park at the garden center and walk on down to where you need to go. And, and just so that you know, Coke and Pepsi was not created by God. Drink you some water. Okay? And in most places, it's still free. They might cost you 15 cents for the cup, but you don't have to pay $1.79 for something that's killing us, okay? The next thing is A, I had to adjust my attitude. Now, we have some attitudes, and I had some attitude. Oh, why me? Why not me, okay? I had to adjust my attitude, and I converted, transformed my attitude to an attitude of gratitude. I wake up every morning in a country that allows me to have liberties that other people around the world can only imagine. And if you don't like living here, there's the Shuttlesworth International Airport who will take you to Iraq, Iran, 
Afghanistan, or any of those other places. I don't see nobody trying to go there. So we should always have an attitude of gratitude. But more than that, if you woke up this morning, it starts right there. It starts right there. So I had to adjust my attitude and be reminded that all things work together for your good. Then the C said I needed to communicate. And everybody thinks communication has to do with you talking. Sometimes you need to listen, listen and learn so that you can become better, so that you can be prepared because life challenges will come, okay? But I want you to be able to live fully in the midst of them. And in part of that communication of listening, sometimes we need to say no. We just need to say no because we end up accepting responsibilities for things and then we're complaining about it later. we mad with the person who asked us. But, see, I have four sisters, okay, and we go through this all the time. Reenactment, ring, ring. <sighs> Hello? Oh, she wants you to do what? Well, why, well, why'd you tell her you want to do it? Well, why are you calling me? <laughs> okay, we bring on these challenges. So then, you know, while I'm on with this sister, a text come in. Call me when you get a chance. So you know, now we got this little family going around a circle over something that could have been avoided if you would have just communicated and said, no, I ain't keeping your children this weekend. Okay? And then when it comes to gaining this peace, because when you have peace, you can live fully, it's E. Just enjoy. You know, I've been told this is the day. We can stop right there. Sometimes we mess stuff up because we're going to run down the next week, next month, next year. He gave you this day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And if you wake up tomorrow morning, you receive new mercies, do it again. Enjoy. Okay, so when you put it all together, you have peace. And when you have peace, you can live fully in the midst of life challenges. And just by the way, that formula that I just shared with you, it don't cost you anything. That's free, okay? None of those things I recommend that you do in order to have peace will cost you anything, okay? Now, in the midst of every storm, we are presented daily the opportunity to pass the test or to fail, to give up or to press on, to wait on the Lord, or take matters into our own hands to achieve victory or allow Satan to take the victory away. We have the opportunity to live fully in the midst of life challenges. Just like the phenomenal sisters of the past, we are often condemned, accused, impatient, have bad judgment, bad attitudes, fearful, stressed, don't see a way, and your joy and peace is being threatened on every side. But be encouraged, my sisters, it ain't over. God's word is true. Romans 8 and 28 says all things. Stop right there. The description of all don't mean only the stuff you want to deal with. It's everything. But he puts it all together for our good. My evidence is not limited to a select group of sisters, the ones I mentioned. All my sisters of faith could have testified up here today. We all have a story, and we all can have that happy ending. Each morning, we are given the opportunity to receive new mercies, for his mercy endures forever. Each morning, we are given the opportunity to achieve, to achieve the impossible with God. Sisters, this is an open and shut case. It's very simple. A price was paid for me, and for you back on Calvary. A savior gave his life so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He made sure that no matter what the circumstances we're going through or whatever we are faced with, we can believe it ain't over, for he's able. There is um, hope, but we must choose it. There is peace, 
but we must accept it. There is time, but we must use it wisely. There is an opportunity to live fully in the midst of life challenges. We just have to do it. Sisters, I sincerely, sincerely thank you for this opportunity, and I thank you as jurors for your time and your attention. I, I truly believe, again, this is an open and shut case, but I need to know that I have proven my case to you, to you, the jury, beyond a reasonable doubt. Amen. Someone here with us may still have some doubts, may still be going through some things and feel like it's over because their challenges are bigger than anything they could have ever imagined. There might still be somebody here who just has given up. And we done put on our masks and we're pretending everything's okay, but we're going back home, falling out, looking for everything and everyone to comfort us but our Father. Amen. On May 28, 2014, I spoke with my husband on the phone at 10 a.m. And I'm going to give you the breaking news version. And um, he said, have the boys ready at 2 o'clock. I'm going to um, take them to the barbershop. I said, okay. At 2 o'clock, I was at Brookwood Hospital. At 10 a.m., I was, at that time, happily married, not semi, but happily married to my husband and best friend for 14 years. I had two little happy sons who loved their father. But that afternoon at 2 o'clock, I found out that I am now a widow, and I'm about to parent alone. Now, what was the day before, the weekend before, was a picnic over in Brown Springs on the east side, having fun and everything. On that Wednesday morning, the world changed. I, I, you know, I humorous the way that I, I cope a lot of times. And I said, I wonder was God and Satan talking about Job and decided can, Satan got permission to do it one more time. And God said, well, okay. He said, why don't you try my child, Joyce? Because she knows who I am and she'll never curse me. Well, I confess, I confess, um, during that time, that was a major shock. Um, it was unexpected. And um, I did not at any time waver on my faith because the book I had just completed was written for the purpose to help people in the midst of life challenges. I was already, the title of the book was, It Ain't Over, okay? And then I said, oh, okay, I guess I got to walk the walk. And then as I read the pages of the book I had written, I decided that I'm not the author of this book. I was only the scribe, okay? Because the things that I wrote prior to May 28 came back to minister to me after May 28. So the God that I served was preparing me to be able to live fully in the midst of life challenges. I share that with you because I stand before you as a living witness and testimony that it ain't over. And whatever you're going through, whatever you're going through, God already knew you were gonna go through it. But the key word is through. You're going through, okay? Don't pack your bags and sit in it, okay? Just pick them up and go on through it. Okay, so I, I hope we now know that it ain't over. But as jurors, I'd like to close the case by just asking you two questions. Number one, can you live fully in the midst of life challenges? You can't, okay? And my second question is, when Satan throws something at you, what three little words can you say to rebuke him? Well, with that said, there's only one more thing I need to say. I rest my case. <laughs>